Okay, um, good morning once again to Political Science 303, ladies and gentlemen. This morning we shall be starting our new case, the US case. Um, we have so far covered a discussion on scope, method, and comparative politics. Then we talked about the modern state, then democracy. Then we've completed our discussion on Britain and France. And next week, you shall be writing a midterm exam on um, Britain and France compared. And um, this morning, we're starting off with the US case. And um, with the US case, we're going to do exactly the same what we've done so far. That is, we'll start with uh, some history, critical junctures, state tradition. OK, how did the US state come about? Um, historical legacy of the past for contemporary politics. And then we'll talk about political economy of economic and social policies. Um, thirdly, we'll talk about governance and policy making. Fourth, uh, interest representation and participation. And finally, we'll talk about um, current challenges. So that's going to be the plan for this case um, for at least four to five lectures. OK, um, so let me start off with um, the map, as usual. We have a large country. It takes about half of the North American continent. Uh, the US territory-wise, geographical spanning-wise, um, it is almost as large as Europe as a continent. Europe, if you divide Europe from the Ural Mountains and the rest. OK, so, so I don't mean Europe, uh, just European states, but this includes a big chunk of Russia, contemporary Russia, and, and, um, and plus uh, the European states. So it's a large country. Um, we've got um, the Russian Federation, China, then US, then Canada, in terms of, its, um, of the geographical span. Uh, 48 plus two, um, two states, 50 states, therefore, or hence, the United States of America. Um, and um, the population is, any, any <coughs> excuse me, any ideas about the US population? Huh? So three, like more than 300 uh, million? No, um, it's 315 million. It, it hovers around 315 million people. Uh, two neighbors, both of which are part of a trade deal, um, which is called the North American Free Trade Area uh, Agreement, uh, Canada and the US. Um, What do you mean? You're well, um, Trump says we'll build a wall. Mr. Trump, President-elect Trump says we'll build a, build a wall. Um, we'll build a beautiful wall. Um, and and um, the wall will be built and paid by Mexico, Mexico, uh, by Mexican government. So uh, yes, uh, there will be a wall. This is one of the electoral pledges. But will there be a wall? We'll see. Uh, so, so both neighbors, up north, Canada, down south, um, Mexico, um, friendly relations with them. Um, the northern border is, I think if I remember correctly, it's the longest border uh, frontier, um, national border, which is not protected. So um, the Americans nor the Canadians Neither of them expect an attack from one another. They have uh, sealed their fate about 200 years ago in 1812, um, and um, the outcome of which, if you ask Canadians, they won. If you ask the Americans, they won. So um, it's a little bit iffy in, in that respect. So, so uh, no border disputes between Canada and the US. Uh, Mexico will see whether how things turn out. 
Uh, but, but I don't personally expect, um, personally, out of personal experience, um, a tough reaction to whatever is happening. Um, rich natural resources, coal, oil, um, and all kinds of metals, uh, large arable land, navigable waters, as you can see, um, and protected ports, natural ports. So abundance of land, abundance of resources. Uh, therefore, when you look at the political economy of the U United States, it's, it's a country known as a resource-rich country. It's, it's massive. Um, it has a lot of resources. Um, let's talk about um, some critical junctures that, that make up or that have a lasting influence on contemporary US politics. Uh, let's start with the Revolutionary Era, 1777 till 1779. Um, 13 American colonies off the East Coast. Um, they're called the American colonies under B British rule. Um, but they say that we want to you know, secede from British rule. So um, we are tired of um, paying taxes for the British Empire. Um, and it did take a war, which is sometimes referred to as the American War, or sometimes referred to as the War of Independence, uh, or sometimes referred to as the Revolutionary War, to, uh, or for the American colonies, to fight against uh, King George III of England. So, um, so there was a war waged between the, the 13 colonies versus the British colonial imperial power. Um, but at this time, there was a civil war in the sense that parts are, or some parts of the population wanted to remain loyal to the British Empire. They were called the loyalists. And uh, the 13 colonies, um, there were the, the elements within the 13 colonies who wanted to um, become independent, uh, these forces were known as the Patriots. So Patriots versus the Loyalists. And the Patriots won by the end of the day. Um, and they declared their independence on July the 4th, 1776. And with the um, Declaration of Independence, um, they they declared a constitution, which were called, which was called back, back then wa, uh, as the Articles of Confederation, uh, which dates back to 1788, which was ratified by the Congress in 1789. So this is basically the first governing document, think of it like the Constitution um, of the United States, um, which gave powers to the states in fact, the powers of the states um, expanded. Um, and this meant that national government was dependent on voluntary contributions of the states. So the national government was dependent on the voluntary contributions of the states. And um, without the state's approval, the national government would not be um, implementing um, foreign policy, taxes, and uh, regulating trade. So, so um, yes, this, this document gave all kinds of powers in the areas of um, commerce, foreign policy, and military policy to the national government, but also it said, look, I'm not going to um, do uh, or act independent of you. So, so you see a, um, a compromise between the states and the federal authority. Uh, so with, with all kinds of expansion of rights at the federal level, but also expansion of rights at the state level. Then a few years later, we see the introduction of what's called the Bill of Rights. Uh, these are the first 10 amendments 
to the Constitution that was just or that had been just passed um, by, the, by the Congress. Um, the Bill of Rights is all about um, protection of citizens, civil rights and liberties um, from the government. So it's basically a list of limits and powers of the federal or central government. Um, it lists all kinds of rights. It's short. It's concise. Um, it says, OK, these are the rights that, would, that we, we, we grant to our citizens. Um, the idea behind the Civil Rights or Bill of Rights was to provide these rights to the citizens um, so that um, they would be protected from any arbitrary power or arbitrary use of power by the government. Um, so basically, this is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, which came as um, one single, unified, coherent document known as the Bill of Rights. Um, financing of the federal government, independent of the states, was one of the issues in the Constitution. Um, <clears throat> the president would be independent of the legislature. It, the, the, the present as an institution, as a post, is now independent of the legislature. And there is limited citizen's voice, um, indirect election of the president, indirect election of the sen senators. And uh, here, women would be not given voting rights. But um, all these rights were expanded by the Bill of Rights. Um, in about a few years. Um, then another critical juncture, another milestone, 100 years later almost, um, is the Civil War and what's called the uh, Reconstruction uh, or the Reconstruction Era. The Civil War grew out of a struggle of power between the national government as opposed to the state governments. So there was much debate with respect to um, the issue of slavery, uh, which had all kinds of um, ramifications about uh, the agricultural sector, um, trade, and all that. But, but the struggle for power um, stemmed from expanding the rights of slavery, I'm sorry, expanding the slavery mode of, or slave mode of production to the Western territories. So slavery was a huge question. Then um, there emerged a civil war on this very issue. Um, for about four to five years, six, 1861 to 1865, um, the Union North fought against the secessionist South, which is called the Confederacy, or Confederate of American States, Confederation of American States. So the North uh, was saying, hey, we want to abolish slavery. And the South says, hey, we're not, we don't want to abolish slavery. In fact, we want to you know, expand slavery to the Western territories. And um, the Civil War ends with the North defeating the South. Um, with the victory of the North, the unions, the unionists, um, slavery was abolished in the entire country. So this was a landmark decision for a young state, uh, which was not even 100 years old. Um, then the entire country was um, under reconstruction um, between 1863 I mean, right in the middle of the, uh, uh, the Civil War, until about 1876, 1877, um, in which we see the restoration of national unity. Um, and in addition, we see the strengthening of the national government. So reconstruction, excuse me, relaunching of the state 
indivisibility of the nation. Um, and with these, uh, immediately after, we, we have or we see the emergence of another amendment, uh, what's called the 14th Amendment, which basically uh, said we're expanding the rights of all citizens to include all freed slaves. Um, so 1868, uh, late 19th century, therefore, we see the Bill of Rights now being applicable to or covering or addressing states, all states, as well as or in addition to the federal actions. And all who were born in the US were declared as citizens of the US. So uh, this includes, by, uh, once again, um, the freed slaves um, for the first time. So, so there was a decision, a landmark decision, um, with the 14th Amendment, 1868, uh, granting of citizenship rights to all um, who were born, all citizens who were born in the US. Um, another landmark or milestone was the New Deal era. Now we're jumping, I mean, first we jumped for, for about 80, 90 years. Now we're jumping from 1860s to 1930s, another 70 years or so. Um, World War I ends. Uh, the US does not participate in World War I, but the Great Depression hits. Um, 1928, stock market crash. Um, New York and elsewhere, um, it, it, it becomes contagious. Uh, it spills over to, uh, to worldwide <coughs> dimensions. Um, and we have unemployment skyrocketing to 40%. Industrial activity plummeting. So uh, we have the United States of Amer America um, industrializing massively with a great speed. Um, but there is a huge decline in worldwide demand for US manufacturers. This meant unemployment rising. Uh, it's an export-oriented economy, too, even back then. And then Roosevelt, President Roosevelt coming to power, says, OK, I'm going to respond in a novel way. And he installs um, what he calls, and his, his followers called, the New Deal. So we, we build a New Deal uh, in response to the world economic crisis and also uh, Great Depression at home. Um, with the Great Depression, after the Great Depression, with the New Deal, I'm sorry, uh, we see an expansion of the federal government in many areas. So the federal government now regulates or has the powers to regulate interstate commerce, um, expands social security for the first time to include, in a way, a universalist ideal of social security um, with the ideas of all kinds of um, um, social security programs uh, ranging from some kind of health care, some kind of pensions, uh, labor's rights, and, um, and new legislation directed toward that. And subsidization of agriculture. That was also a policy that was, um, you know, that was implemented to, um, to resist or to, um, to tame the agricultural cycle. You know, there, the agricultural cycle is exposed to fluctuations. So we want to tame that cycle by providing uh, subsidies to our farmers. Um, <clears throat> so the federal government, in a way, asserts its dominance, especially in the, in the area of social security, uh, over state government. So expansion of the federal government at the expense of state government. So this was an era in which we see strengthening of the federal government, the national government, at the expense of um, state government. And the idea was during the New Deal era with the Social Security um, uh, expanding as a program, as a, as a major field 
of state activity as a major field of state intervention, uh, the idea of um, national citizenship was expanded. Um, 1930s, 1933, 1940s. So all throughout the 1930s, um, we see the expansion of the uh, social security and also the idea of national citizenship, which ends up with World War II. Um, <clears throat> during this period, we see the powers of the president expanding, um, but still the Constitution says it's the Congress which is the central institution here. Um, the president never has any legislative power, as we shall be talking about, but his powers to push through his agenda had been expanding since then. Um, this was a period, in a way, an early consensus period. Remember we talked about the collectivist consensus in Britain and the Trente Glorieuse in France. Um, there was an early consensus back in the 1930s in the US, a democratic consensus, that there was some kind of a class compromise. So class-based politics was kept to a minimum. So, so that was interesting to observe in this country. Um, after the New Deal, we jump to another um, um, institutionalized, regime-like milestone. Um, up until the 1960s, um, we had Democrats coming to power in consecutive terms. But from 1960s onwards, we see the emergence of an institution called divided government. Um, when we talk about divided government, we should refer to um, the separation of powers. Um, so here we've got the executive, um, organs of state, the legislature, and the judiciary. The legislature is a bicameral legislature. We've got the Congress here. And it is composed of the House of Representatives. We'll talk about these in more detail later on. But I just want to show you um, what happened in history. And we've got the Senate here. The executive is the president, and the judiciary is Supreme Court and the lower system of courts, or the system of lower courts. When we talk about divided government, divided government, this means that, and, and we know that there are two major coalitions or political parties in the country, um, if we have a Republican president, a Republican House of Representatives, or Republican-dominated House of Representatives, and Democrats, Demo you know, Democrat-controlled Senate, then this is a case of divided government. We can, we can do all kinds of permutations. Um, uh, of course, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Democrat, um, um, Democrat, Republican, and all that. So, so this means that the executive versus the legislature, so it may be divided, there may be a division with respect to who controls which organ of state, which branch of government, or that there would be, because of the bicameral nature of the system, we see divided government or divided Congress with respect to the House or who controls the House and who controls the Senate. So since 1969, um, we had only five instances of the opposite of divided government. The opposite of divided government is called unified control. Okay, so. Um, the presidency and the Congress had been dominated by, by one single party 
only five times until this year, until the end of this year. So Democrats controlled till, I mean, or since 1968, Democrats controlled all three institutions, i.e. the president and both houses in the Congress, both chambers, from 1977 till 1980 for about four years, 1993 till 1994 under Clinton, uh, I'm sorry, under, um, yes, under Clinton. Uh, then 2009-2010 under Obama. Okay, so um, one, two, three instances. And if you add up the, the numbers, do the math, it's, it's just a few number of years. The Republicans controlled all three positions, or um, one position and the institutions, the two chambers, at the same time. Um, in 2001, 2003, 2007, with Mr. Trump's election, with the Senate as well as the House being controlled by the Republican Party, uh, we'll have, we'll be witnessing the sixth time with, uh, of um, a Republican president, a Republican House of Representatives or Republican dominated House of Representatives and a Republican dominated Senate. Um, and this would be called what's the opposite of um, um, government, divided government. It's called unified control. Um, we refer to divided government in the US. What would be its counterpart in France? So what would we be calling, in the case of France, we have one party dominating the legislature and the other party dominating, I'm sorry, one party, yeah, of course, one party dominating uh, the legislature and hence the lower arm of the executive, the cabinet, that part of the executive, and the other executive, i.e. the president. So when we have a prime minister and the president not coming from the same party, not representing the same party, then we'd call that cohabitation, um, which may be a good question in the exam. Um, so, so the sixth time will be next year, where we will have a House of Representatives dominated by, uh, with a majority of um, Republicans, the Senate with a, with a you know, slight majority, 51 to 49 or 52 to 48, we'll see, um, and the president all representing the same political party, with the same political faction. Um, so, so it'll be the fourth time uh, under Republicans, um, <clears throat> and um, therefore, what's what's important to remember is that unified government has been an exception since 1968, and I think from 1928, um, yeah, we had we had this. Uh, also, but um, but we had we had an, quite a number of years um, being. I mean, the re Republicans dominating all all these three uh, organs or two organs at the same time, um, and and we'll see that uh, the judiciary, the Supreme Court, may also be dominated by. Um, the Republicans, in the sense that we now have um, four justices who are liberal, who are more pro-Democrat, uh, another four who are um, more conservative, who would be thinking along the lines of Republicans. We have one missing justice, which, or who will be appointed by, uh, who was thought to be appointed by um, um, President Obama, 
But now we'll have um, President Trump um, appointing that, that judge. So uh, we will also have um, a conservative uh, dominated Supreme Court um, soon too. So at the end of these, um, all these elections that have been taking place um, a few days ago. Um, so, so 2017, things will be like with respect to the House of Representatives, 239 seats, Republican, 193 seats, Democrat, um, Senate 51 to 52 Republican versus 48 to 49 Democrat, and the presidency um, will be, um, you know, will be a, will be controlled by the Republicans, um, and the Supreme Court. We have once again four conservative justices, uh, four liberal leaning justices, and we'll have probably most probably the fifth one as either a moderate or a conservative too. Um, all of the idea of divided government means that the government is exposed to all kinds of lobbying. So it becomes easier to lobby um, when you have especially divided government. Um, so, so it really boosts interest group activity. Um, then comes September 11, um, 2001, 2001, and its aftermath. There have been some concerns about um, expansion of the federal government at the expense of uh, state governments um, and infringement of or on rights and liberties by individuals. So, so there has been some concern about what's called, uh, in the American jargon, big government, expansion of the, especially the federal government. But we, do, we never had a national consensus of um, which way to go, um, you know, whether we should, we should expand the uh, privileges of the federal government uh, or the state government, or we should keep it as such, or expand the privileges, the rights of um, the powers of the state level. So, so there was no consensus, but um, the idea of big government was welcomed after the September 11 attacks. So the government, uh, the Bush administration in that respect had a, um, a, a strengthened hand with respect to all the policies. The invasion of Iraq was a watershed that it, it really started to polarize the country. Up until, now, up until then, um, from 2001 till 2003, there was, you know, the US was one. Uh, the idea the, or the ideal of a pluribus unum, uh, out of many, one, united in diversity, uh, was very much there. But, um, but after the invasion of Iraq, things got upset a little bit. I have a question here. Uh, so in the first quarter of the 2016, the, the chief of attorney in the Supreme Court was that? Uh, was? Was? Die. Di okay. Ha oh, oh, had died, had passed away. Yes. Uh, Justice Scalia, yes. And, uh, in the headlines, we saw the, uh, the Obama uh, was going to nominate mm -hmm. his own candidate mm -hmm. for the election. Mm -hmm. And I guess the Republicans tried to prevent this from uh, happening. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. question here is that uh, why they are Why are the Republicans so concerned? Is there any, uh, That's a good question. Yeah. Of course. As yeah. far as I know, mm -hmm. the, the, the president has the uh, veto rights on the uh, and proposal, law proposal, for example. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's, the Supreme Court has, has this right. 
we'll talk about this in more detail later on, but the Supreme Court has a huge weight in the system. Um, the Supreme Court rulings will or have to be obeyed by everyone. So um, what, the, what the House as well as the Senate did was to, to in a way, play a game, take the risk of wait and see until who comes or who becomes president next. So they thought or they bet their, their money on um, the Republican candidate and they won in the sense that they, they wished to say, hey, President Obama, um, if you want to push through your candidate, your nominee, um, we may overturn that. So unless, I mean, this will be, I mean, we will discuss this in more detail, but the most important aspect of US politics is that you have to negotiate. And you have to coordinate, you have to collaborate. Unless you negotiate, unless you, um, you collaborate, that is, if you push through your agenda unilaterally, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't do that. You don't do that. You don't, um, you, don't get, you don't become successful because of all kinds of uh, institutional features of the system. We'll talk about this in more detail when we talk about the, uh, the, the setup of the government. But these are all uh, co-equal branches of government. Um, and there are checks and balances. Uh, so the separation of powers also mean that you, you have to collaborate no matter what. OK, we'll, we'll discuss um, all of these with examples. Yes, please. Actually, uh, that's the reason why we all uh, avoid American democracy, because uh -huh. uh, checks and balances mm -hmm. work efficiently. Mm -hmm. Because in the same example, uh, efficiently, I don't know. Effectively, yes. Efficiently, this is known as the most inefficient uh, government type. Um, efficiency means that you can, uh, in, in public policy making, you, it means you can pass legislation quickly, and then uh, once there is, you know, there is everybody okay's it, it becomes law, and it, yeah. But but effectively, yes, it's an it's an effective system, in which we see. Um, checks and balances, but but I I just wanted to give you highlights of some his history. Uh, we'll we'll talk about the details later on. I know you're you're all excited about talking about this, um, and we we think about this all the time um, in this country too. Um, but but just just be a little bit more patient when we discuss the organization of the state, uh, co-equal branches of government, um, checks and balances. Um, horizontal checks and balances, as well as the vertical checks and balances, we'll discuss all the details. But give me a moment to, to, um, to complete this historical critical junctures so that we are all on the same page with respect to, you know, these are the themes that really bear their mark on contemporary politics. Um, invasion of Iraq, then comes the USA Patriot Act, United, Sta United in Strengthening America by providing appropriate tools to intercept and, and obstruct terrorism act. So um, again, this was it. first, um, there was not much um, domestic response to it, uh, but later it, beca it became uh, a, a, uh, an issue of contention. The act brought a dramatic expansion of the federal government with respect to surveillance, with respect to law enforcement, and limits on civil liberties um, in the fight against terrorism, or in the name of the fight against terrorism. So, so, so this was another critical juncture in the sense that um, the act allowed the government to expand its powers, to push through uh, its agenda vis-a-vis uh, -vis its citizens. Uh, then invasion of Afghanistan, um, first international support. Then it had been waning throughout. Um, and the difficulty of 
the Bush administration after Hurricane Katrina, 2005, August. Um, and there were problems with Bush's re-election, um, which we may talk about later, and opposition from our allies, um, not only, I mean, uh, in France, what's called, uh, you know, what, what Secretary of um, Defense Donald Rumsfeld back then called Old Europe, um, but also Heartland Europe. So, so everybody was against, uh, at some point, what, the, what many saw as the overextension of the United States, um, that there were uh, foreign policy, in the eyes of many, there were foreign policy mistakes, uh, as they saw. And, um, and many still see um, the US as you know, overstepping into the Middle East and elsewhere. Uh, in its neighborhood so that you know whatever we're having today has something to do with whatever the Bush administration did back then. Uh, that was why, or one of the reasons why, the Obama administration wanted to withdraw um, from, from Afghanistan but also from, from Iraq and elsewhere. Um, so, so these were basically the landmarks uh, or, or the critical junctures in which we had the expansion, as you can see, you see the expansion of the state, state power, uh, national government, vis-a-vis, um, -vis at some points, at some critical junctures, uh, or at the expense of state-level uh, jurisdictions. So, um, so basically, these are the critical junctures um, in US history, which have um, ramifications for our discussions when we talk about um, the organization of the state and also uh, we'll talk about social policy. So we'll come back to the New Deal era. Um, we'll talk about uh, interest representation and participation. Uh, we'll talk about uh, divided government, lobbying, iron triangles and all that. So, so basically uh, think of this as a preview of coming attractions um, as you see in the movies. Um, but, but as you see, what's, what's important here is that there has been a continuity with respect to the expansion of the federal government, the role of the state, the penetrative ability of the state, um, the centralized state or central state, federal state, uh, in the lives of its citizens. I think that concludes my discussion here. Um, next class, we'll start with, well, first we'll write the midterm exam. And next Friday, we'll start with um, political economy of economic and social policies. Oh, I'm sorry, no, no, of course not. We'll, we'll start with uh, uh, the organization of the state. OK, I'll see you next class. <laughs>